Welcome to this Epson Position Consensus Dermatological Ultrasound webinar. This webinar is, is hosted by, by me, that is from Dr. Fernando Fakemet. I am a dermatologist. I will chair this, uh, this webinar that is offered to Epson members, but also to the World Society of Ultrasound and Medicine. That's to say that we are now reaching the, a global impact with this uh, uh, webinar. This webinar is going to be seen not only in Europe, but also in America, in AU, and, and African society, and, and the Asian society. And the impact of this dermatological ultrasound webinar, versing on the co position consensus that we reached in Epsom, is going to be global. Then I would like to thank Epsom for, for, uh, for, for being a platform for broadcasting all these uh, recommendations we are going to give through this position consensus. About my background, a uh, dermatologist, specialized in dermatologic ultrasound, clinical dermatologist. I will deal with patients every day, and, and ultrasound is a tool that I use every day. And, and not, it's not only me, but a big group of dermatologists now doing that, and a big group of, of radiologists also doing that, as you will see. I wouldn't like to, uh, to forget to acknowledge uh, the immense help of Miss Lynn Root that has been the soul, the support, the experience of this uh, of this consensus and one of the of the mo most uh, most important people referring the development of our self a speciality from Epsom level. She's been uh, helping us a lot from the beginning. I would also like to uh, to, to thank Professor Sidhu and Dr. Jensen for their, con their continuous help from the methodological point of view. Without uh, their help, um, it wouldn't have come to, to light. And now we have here, this is our, uh, our because it's the work of an enthusiastic group of both radiologists and dermatologists regarding a positioning of uh, the European Society of Ultrasound about dermatologic ultrasound. I will cover the part of methodology and some parts of the consensus. The rest is going to be done by my colleagues. They are both dermatologists and radiologists that I will introduce you, or they, they will introduce themselves too that have been part of this consensus and they wanted to present you their respective parts. And at the end of this webinar, we will have the opportunity to have questions and answers from us, the board of this, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, consensus. That's, I think it's an amazing opportunity. If you are starting or you are doing dermatologic ultrasound in your practice. Regarding methodology of this position, uh, positioning consensus, the executive board of the European Federation of Ultrasound Medicine decided that a group of experts in, in this discipline started doing research and putting all the more or less clear things that we were in literature in some topics that we can study and we could reach a consensus. We've always followed the policy document of development strategy that has been recently released by Epson. The main topics were selected by this steering group and we did our research regarding these topics. After that, we had a meeting all together in the Eurozone Congress in Granada and we reached a consensus. We used the technique of phenomenal group technique as described in this slide. Who was part of this steering committee? As you see, there is a number of nine uh, experts and the number of radiologists and dermatologists is quite balanced, but for Eugenio Cereso that was with us because he has been fostering this speciality from the beginning. And with this balance, we tried to see this, uh, this application from both dermatologic point of view, from the clinician point of view, um, but also from the radiologist point of view. The main topics that we were discussing were first technical requirements for dermatologic ultrasound, ultrasound of skin tumors, inflammatory skin diseases, aesthetic dermatologic ultrasound, 
And finally, professional requirements, reports, training, and accreditation in dermatologic ultrasound. You see here the number of recommendations that were elaborated. I will cover the first part, the technical requirements of dermatologic ultrasound, and the last part, as professional requirements, reports, and training. The rest is going to be uh, covered by my colleagues, Dr. Christian from Germany, Dr. Rustan from, uh, from Spain, and Dr. Borsman from Chile, for Chile. Regarding the technical requirements, our first position statement was regarding the operator that, who was performing the, the, the exploration. The, this operator that is going to be a physician uh, must be knowledgeable about the patient historic uh, clinical findings. And this request should be available. With respect to this matter, to this position statement, you, you see here an example of wrong request. We cannot uh, have a request, we as uh, clinicians, we cannot request an exploration with this request. Identify possible causes of redness in this area. It's quite in a specific. An example of right request would be inflammatory area in thigh area, 5 15 days of evolution. Please assess the presence of, of access of foreign bodies. We now here uh, we have a target, a target exploration with enough clinical data and, his, and, and clinical history data to make a kind of orientation of the diagnosis for the dermatologist or the dialyst who is going to do the diagnosis. The second position statement was regarding machines. We, uh, we, we, were, we, we agreed on the, the, that the minimum would be 50 MHz because it was a, a, a problem between what is high frequency or, or low frequency? And we had to set a limit downwards. And the limit was 50 MHz. We also reflected that higher transducer frequencies will give us more information that may be relevant, but not necessarily. May give us this, uh, this, this information. This is a very nice example of how the frequency may vary the information we get from our explorations. On your left, you would have the, altogether the context of the cyst. With the higher frequency, you would have the more detailed uh, aspect of these lesions regarding the lining. For example, you see here, this is the lining of the cyst that may not be seen in the, in the lower frequency. Both images are important because this is going to give us a context, okay? And this is the detail. One, one does not discount the other. Then we we agreed that both give us information and should be used when we do our explorations. Regarding the position statement number three, we agreed that the color Doppler and power Doppler was important in dermatological ultrasound because it is going to give us information regarding the inflammatory is, is, is state of the skin or the neovascularization in, kind, in, in some kind of tumors. This is a nice example. We have this image here that may be assist or not, but when we go for the Doppler and we adjust some parameters, we see that in traditional vascularization that discard the possibility of this cyst that would be a leomyoma. But only this feature has helped us to uh, give us a different uh, diagnosis than the presence of the, or the presence of vascularization be, the inside the tumors. It's very important, as in other subspecialties. Then, for dermatology ultrasound, also Doppler is important. Position and statement number four is regarding the systematic exploration of oncogenicity of skin and appendages, because our specialty deals with not only with the skin, but also with nails and hair. And this echogenicity must be reported. And as I will give you a nice example here. This is a hair follicle, normal hair follicle, that we see with a high, high frequency, 22 MHz probe. And we see that it changes, and the echogenicity changes, and this is indicative of uh, inflammation. In this in inflammatory patients detecting this presence of inflammation of follicular aspects of our scalp is important. 
then this echogenicity must be reported because it's re re referring and histopathological correlate, as we will see in the recommendations afterwards. This is the last recommendation or position statement regarding the technique. Special care should be taken to standardized examination and the measurements are performed at the exact, at the exact points of view with the same parameters in order to show the reposibility of the examination. This is a, a nice example of how important it is to know where the image has been taken. In this case of aplasia cutis in a, in a child, it's important to know that the normal area, pyrrhine area, is the image on, on the left. And to, to, to assess for an evolution of this uh, uh, disease, for example, it would be important to know which part corresponds to disease area, which part corresponds to normal looking area, to be able to make a follow-up. And it should be reflected also in our report. With that, we have covered the main five recommendations of technical requirements for dermatological ultrasound. I will go to number five, and my colleagues will deal with the rest of recommendations regarding ultrasound of skin tumors, inflammatory skin diseases, and aesthetic dermatology. Regarding the professional requirements, reports and training in accreditation and dermatological ultrasound, the position statement 21 says that we we should, this dermatological ultrasound should be performed by an adequate, adequately trained physician with knowledge on both clinical and sonographic dermatology. Then, those who are doing due to sound dermatological ultrasound must know dermatology, maybe not as well as a dermatology, but have the main concepts. Then that's a challenge because we have to learn some dermatology and we, as Dermatologists have to learn some ultrasound. And this the, the mixture I told you before, this is very enriching for both uh, parts, for both radiologists and for ultrasonographers, dermatologists. What must radiologists learn? Radiologists must learn clinical dermatology, the description of the lesions, the main terms, and the therapeutic implications of some diagnosis. And what as a dermatologist must learn the ultrasound basis of explorations, the sonographic terms, and the possibilities and limitations of the technique. If we both know all these things, this is going to be a very interesting dialogue, dialogue between our specialities, and we are going to make the most of this exploration. We have to aim to make this cross talk between specialities to foster this, uh, this application of ultrasound. Regarding Written report, this is important, and written report must be written for either a radiologist or a dermatologist performing ultrasound. Without report, there is no exploration. And this report should be uh, should be together with high quality images that should be recorded, stored, and made available for a follow-up examination as and in any other uh, speciality. An example of round report would be in specific hyperacoic area to correlate with clinical findings. This is useless. We cannot use this report for anything. We should aim for well done reports with information that is relevant for the clinician and suggesting the possibilities of at least two, three differential diagnoses based on, in, on our knowledge of the clinical aspects of the patient and also the ultrasonography. That's the reason why in dermatologists in, in ultrasound is so important to know also the clinics of the, of the patient. And the clinical knowledge is important both for dermatologists and both for the radiologists doing this technique. Regarding position style statement number 23, this is about the training. Basic courses on dermatologic ultrasound should be both theoretical and practical with minimum two days of training. These clinical images should be available for, for training since clinical sonographic correlation is the key of this application. This, in this application, the clinical image, the photograph of the lesion, and the ultrasonographic aspect of it, it is fundamental. This is a nice example of what it was the dermatologic ultrasound course, the Eurosound School in Madrid in 2008. It looks like ages, but it was two years ago. 
as you see, it's two days program with both a theoretical, uh, clinical, and practical uh, practical part with uh, with hands-on equipment adjustment, examination examination techniques, and with patients. That that was very enriching because the presence of patients is good because sometimes the the access to this kind of of pathology is not easy and the opportunity of having uh, at least 20, 20 patients to evaluate a dermatology patient is luxury, luxury, and we should aim at this uh, this possibility of doing exploration in real patients. This is a nice picture of the participants of the course with the faculty. You see, we were quite a lot from all over Europe, half dermatologists, half radiologists. And we had a great time and we learned a lot. That is the most important thing. Position and statement number 24 is regarding maintaining the skills. Uh, this is quite uh, important and maybe sometimes different from other specialties in which maybe histopathology is not uh, available, but in dermatology, histopathology is available. And only by this correlation we can learn and keep our skills, our diagnostic skills. If we check we, if we have done right or wrong, it's the only way to learn if our diagnosis are right or wrong. And the ideal would be to have both clinical, histopathological, or ultrasound all together and make this nice correlation of what corresponds to each part, which clinical parts correspond to ultrasound, uh, image, and which part. So that for next cases, we can also make this diagnosis without the necessity of going for a biopsy. That is one of the main uh, objectives of our techniques, avoiding unnecessary biopsies that are usually not very, very comfortable for our patient. But if necessary, they should be done. As you've seen, we have covered the first part and the fifth part, and my colleagues now will follow with very, very interesting position statements regarding skin tumors, skin diseases, and aesthetic dermatologic ultrasound. Thank you very much for your attention.